Great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Wonderful to talk to you all, to, to see you all, to be connected in this way. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be in touch with you, be able to talk with you and share with you this morning. Wonderful. Hope you've all had a great week. Hope you've all had a blessed week. I know last week we left on a real punch, a real high, because the book of Joshua is, you know, pretty awesome. And, you know, about taking the promised land and all that. But this week, we're going to talk about the book of Judges. So let's start. Let's talk about the book of Judges right now. We're going to get right in there. And um, part of me wants to apologize for the book of Judges because <laughs> it actually is... Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, the book of Judges is... Um, well, it's a tough one because it's, um, it's, it talks about a lot of failure on the part of Israel. So it, it's not, it's, um, it doesn't make, it's not a feel good book, but it's a real good teaching book. It, it, it helps you to understand things from God's perspective after all the warnings that Moses and Joshua gave to the children of Israel. And when you don't heed the warnings of God, you know, you're not in for anything good. So that's sort of where we're starting off in the book of Judges. So let's, let's look at a bit of basic information on the book of Judges. Okay. So it's called the book of Judges, and it means deliverers or saviors. Um, and according to one commentary, it's also known as the book of failure through compromise. So I don't know if I was in a library and I saw a book called The Book of Failure Through Compromise. If I go, oh my goodness, I totally have to have that book. I must pull that book off the shelf and read that straight away. I, I don't know that I would do that. But a uh, good thing it's called Judges, so we don't actually get to see the you know name and what it has been referred to. And so then we read it and we do learn so much, okay? So the authorship of the book is unknown. So, um, yeah, we don't really know who wrote it, but it has been attributed to the prophet Samuel. Now, this book was written, get this, 400 years after the death of Joshua, okay? But it covers Israel's history from Joshua's death till 400 years later, okay? And the primary verses that sum up the book's theme are Judges 2.10, which says, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Okay, so we're looking at a people who did not know all the wonderful things that God did for Israel. Even after Moses and Joshua said, do not take the book of the law out from your face. Write it on your forehead. Write it on your arm. Put it on your, the sides of your door. Get that, that law, the words of God. Put it before your face continually. Obviously, they did not do that. Okay? And so there was a whole generation that passed away and a new generation that arose that did not know the Lord or anything, all the wondrous things that he'd done for Israel, parting the Red Sea, water from a rock, you know, the, the cloud and the fire that, that they followed through the wilderness. All of them forgot all of it, okay? And the other verse that is primary to the book of Judges is Judges 21, 25. And you just see this repeatedly throughout the book. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Okay? So that verse, in those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, or everyone did as they saw fit. That is a primary verse for the book of Judges, and it will help you understand so much of Judges. Okay. So first of all, you need to understand what is a judge according to the Bible. And it's not what you would think a judge is by our Western standards. To, now, this was before they had any kings. They had Moses who led them. They had Joshua who led them. Then after Joshua, no one led them. Because what happened was everyone went to their own land, didn't they? And then it was, it was more like 
each tribe sort of led themselves, okay? So there were no kings yet, so judges were appointed for each, you know, for, for well, for Israel. The judge would be for the judge overall of Israel. It was more like not someone who sits in a court with a gavel and, and goes, you know, hear ye, hear ye, this I shall pronounce the law now on you. It was more like a tribal chieftain, okay? A judge was not someone like that we would know to be a judge who makes um, judgments based for crimes based on the law. But this kind of judge was more of a military leader. And you could see them come into play mostly when Israel's in trouble and needs someone with military skills to save them. Um, there was a woman judge, yes, a woman judge over Israel, and her name was Deborah. She was the only woman judge mentioned, um, and she was a pretty good judge as well, one of the better ones, okay? Um, one of the better ones mentioned, and she comes the closest to what we would know as a judge who would hear people's issues and judge them, but she was also a military leader. Um, and she led, and she was a prophetess, it mentions as well, but she led them to victory, okay? It's one for the ladies there. Okay, so the book of Judges is a, about a very dark time in Israel's history. Now, us today as Christians, when we go through stuff and life gets hard and we need encouragement, we need, you know, we're looking to the Bible for encouragement and comfort, you're probably not going to go to the book of Judges because it's not that kind of book. It's not like the book of Psalms. It's not like the book of Isaiah where you find these verses that just feed your spirit and encourage you and, and bring you to, you know, from down here to, oh, up here, Lord, yes, you know, bring me to the mountaintops. Okay, you probably wouldn't go to Judges for that. You might do, I don't know. I mean, I'm lots of different kinds of folks out there. Someone might find that very encouraging. I don't know. Okay, okay, so it's a tragic and gory book and it leaves the reader feeling upset and because it's showing you that when you abandon and forget God and do what is right in your own eyes instead of what is right in God's eyes, that the picture is grim. And the book tells of Israel's moral corruption and bad leadership and um, how they were meant to be God's set apart people. Remember that? We were, they were going to be God's set apart special treasure. But they moved into the promised land like God enabled them to, and they became no different than the Canaanites. With all the Canaanite evil religious practices and idols, they moved right in next to their neighbors, the Canaanites, and became just like them. They let the Canaanites influence them rather than they taking over the evil in the land. So as Christians, we also, we have God's word, right? Which we're to obey, like the children of Israel were to obey God's word back then. And when we decide either purposefully or through a slow drifting away of God, when we find ourselves having rejected God in, in some way, we, we find ourselves being just like the world around us with all its ungodly ways. You might not even realize it that, you know, the world is getting into you. You might not realize it. And it's a bit like a boat, isn't it? When you get too much of what's around you in the boat, that's when the boat sinks, okay? And we look to Jesus. He's our greatest example of all that is good and righteous and done right. You know, Jesus is a perfect example of how we can live. I know you say, oh, but he was the son of God. He was perfect. He can't do. You know, it says in the word of God that as he was in this world, so are we. That's what the scripture says. So, you know, Jesus had choices and he had power and he could do whatever he wanted. But you know what he chose to do? It says that he only did what he saw the Father do. That was in John 5, 19 through 20. So how can we ever be above that? You know, he was our ultimate example, all right? That we do what the Father does, what the Father instructs us to do. And where do we see what the Father instructs us to do is in the Word of God. We know what God wants us to do based on what the Word of God tells us God loves and God doesn't love, what God blesses and what God doesn't bless. And we go according to that. Okay, so how does reading and studying the book of Judges relate to my life, all right? Well, I'm going to read to you a quote from Bible.org, which I thought was really beautiful, and I don't think I can put it any better. So I'm going to read you this quote, okay? And it, and it says, 
I believe we can readily see how the book of Judges is relevant to our culture in America and elsewhere around the world, obviously written by an American. We live in a postmodern age where it is believed that there is no absolute truth, but that all truth is in the eye of the beholder. That is precisely what was happening in ancient Israel during the days of the judges. Every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. The sex and violence of that day is little different, both in kind and in degree, to our own times. I believe that while we are not the nation Israel, we are experiencing similar circumstances to those described in Judges. Mm, sobering. So, although this is an ancient text, Judges, we're seeing the attitudes of disregard for God in our modern society and a similar display of godlessness. And I think we, you know, our societies and us personally would do well to note this example so clear in the scripture. And it's this, that godlessness or a, a forsaking of the one true God equals failure um, and moral low in one's personal world and in society, okay? Um, when, you, when you have no God and you exclude God, you can go to moral lows that you only, that you probably never imagined, okay? You make room for that when you push God out. All right, so how is this book broken up and what's going on in each section? Let's look a little bit at the plot of Judges. Okay, so chapters one through two. Now, it talks about their failure straight from the beginning. They don't drive out the remaining Canaanites, which they were meant to do. They were meant to do that with the number one thing God wanted them to do once they got into Canaan. Now, Joshua took a lot of the land. He did what he was meant to do, but you know, he only lived so long, right? And at the time of his death, there was still a lot of land to be taken. Um, and lots of Canaanite tribes all around where they settled. And they obviously, the Canaanite tribes, had big impact on the lives of the Israelites. And the Canaanites' immoral ways corrupted Israel, even though they had been warned time and time again. I mean, do you remember Moses' song? I mean, it was huge, this goodbye parting song that Moses wrote. And it was huge. And it was, it was a warning to these children of Israel, you know, just put God in front of you. Don't take him away from the front of your eyes. You know, remember him always. And, and he told them what to do. He even warned them what to do should they find themselves having gotten into a very moral low and a place away from God. He told them, repent, come back to God, and he will be there. Okay, anyway, so all the immoral ways got into Israel and... Um, you know, they were warned that bad things would happen and bad things would come of that sort of disobedient behavior. So the narrator of the book gives an overview of what is going to happen in the book uh, and speaks of Israel's, this is kind of important to the book of Judges. He speaks of, this narrator, the repetitive sin cycles, okay? They get into these repetitive sin cycles, the, the, the Israelites, and we see them again and again. So he writes that Israel would sin, they'd be punished in oppression, you know, then they'd have some tribe coming after them, you know, to destroy them. They would cry out in their oppression, Israel would just cry out, and they'd repent before God, and then God would raise up a judge, a deliverer, who would defeat the enemy and bring about a time of peace. And then Israel would sin again and repeat the whole cycle again and again and again. And we see it with every judge in the book of Judges that that is how the story begins. I mean, it is quite noticeable that it's something we should take note of. Okay, uh, chapters 3 through 16. And this section speaks of Israel's corrupt judges and points out uh, their failures and disobedience in not doing what God asked. Israel's leaders are seen going from like, they start out okay, so with the first three judges, they're okay. Then the next three are a little worse. And then, well, the final ones are just bad. So they progressively become more and more corrupt. And you can see the progression of corruption. So the first three judges are called Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah. So they were the ones that were okay. And they defeated the enemies. There was lots of blood and battle. 
um, but they bring about peace. Then slightly more of a moral decline enters in and we have the next three judges um, and their stories are, are longer and they get into the moral issues and the character flaws of these judges um, of their lives. So we have Gideon and he was a coward and he finally comes to trust God and he wins the battle and at the end of it, at the end of his battle, if you would have read his story, there was a bunch of Israelites who wouldn't join him in the battle. They didn't want to help because they didn't have any faith in, in Gideon. They, they were like, you're going to get us all killed. I don't want to join with you. And Gideon's like, oh yeah, you'll see. So Gideon does win the fight, but he comes back to this, his brothers, Israelites, and he kills them all. I mean, we see moral decline in brother killing brother, you know? It's a little bit like when Cain slew Abel, but on like a more gigantic scale, okay? So he murders a bunch of Israelites that didn't want to help him fight, because uh, they, yeah, so that was terrible. And then Gideon celebrates winning the battle, right, against his enemies by taking gold that he won from the battle and making an idol from it and worshiping it and causing all of Israel to bow down and worship the idol. Can you believe it? But we see moral decline here. This is something God said, do not worship idols. One of the 10 commandments. And he broke that one big time and he caused all of Israel to break it as well. But there was peace for a short time. And then the cycle of sin begins again. Okay, then we have the next judge. Jephthah, his name is, not a nice man at all, okay? He lives in the hills, and when Israel's enemies rise up, the elders of Israel, they go to him for help. And he wins lots of battles, but his story shows us that he and all of Israel, they don't anymore know how to relate to the God of Israel. They just do not know what God wants. They do not know how to relate to the God of Israel like Moses did and like Joshua did. They're completely clueless. And he, Jephthah, treats God like he would, um, excuse me, like one of the Canaanite gods. And there's this tragic story in there that leaves you feeling just yucky inside, where he wins the battle, but he had made a vow to God that if God would let him win this battle, that he would offer whatever came through his front door at him. And guess who comes through his front door? His beautiful little daughter. And so he feels he must honor God with this child sacrifice, which was something God would not want. And if he knew God, and if he knew all of the things that Moses and Joshua had taught, he'd know that he did not have to do that and God would not require that. But he did it. He sacrifices his young daughter to God on an altar, killing her. And God would not, if he knew God, he would know that was a no-no and God did not want that. So there you go. So this story shows how far Israel has fallen away from God. Remember in Leviticus and the law and how worship was to be carried out so specifically and everything was so specific. And if this sin happened, you can do this and you use this animal. And, you, and there was so much written in the book of Leviticus for how worship should happen and what God wanted. All gone. I mean, it still existed, but they were not looking at it. Okay, they forgot about it. And now we have the ever popular Samson, okay? Samson, I know we teach our Sunday school kids about him, but we really clean up the story, don't we? Because if you told them the actual story, eh, there's lots of things that your kids might not really know yet, especially at the ages, and you would not even want to tell them. He had no regard for God, Samson. He was the worst of the judges. He started out with a lot of promise, but he was promiscuous, he was arrogant and violent, and he won victories over the Philistines, but in his ending was awful and violent, very awful ending. But you'll notice throughout the book of Judges that the Holy Spirit of God comes upon these very ungodly and morally corrupt people to carry out God's bidding in winning these battles. Um, and, victories are there, and victories are wrought for the Israel. Israelites, okay? Um, and But this is the thing. God had no other choices except to work with these people who were corrupt because they were the best of a bad bunch. Okay, so God never endorses 
their bad behavior. You will not read that God said, well, it's okay that he made this idol, and it's okay that he did this to this woman, and it's okay that, you know, none of it. He never endorsed it, okay? And I think it would be wrong for us to read it with the attitude that, oh, God can use immoral people. Um, you know, so if we're immoral and we don't do things God wants and we live outside of God's, you know, will and we live in a disobedience, it's okay. We don't need to worry about it. Whew, God can still use us. No, that's not the point of the book of Judges, all right? Yes, he can use all of us. He can use anyone, right? But if your story was being written, okay, this is how you got to look at it. If your story was being written and was included in here, would you want it to be a Joshua type of story? Or would you want it to be a, Sam, a Samson type character story? I mean, I know what I would want. I know what I would want. Okay, so chapter 17 through 21. In this section of the book, we see the last two stories in Judges. And they are shocking, okay? Just simply shocking. And many people have wondered how they even got into the Bible because they are so awful. They really are so awful. But they're included to just show how corrupt Israel has become since the days of Joshua and that a godless life has no bottom on it for how deep and ugly a godless life can take someone. There's no bottom on it, okay? There's no bottom on that well. It just goes deep and it keeps going, all right? And the key verse that Israel had no king, which we discussed at the beginning, Israel had no king and did what was right in their own eyes, is repeated four times. It's the very last words of the book as well um, in this section, 17, uh, chapter 17 through 21, four times. So the narrator wants us to know they had no good leadership, no good godly leadership, no king leading them, and everyone did just whatever they felt was right and not what God wanted. The first of these two horrible stories that I just mentioned and how they even got in there was the first one's about a priest called Micah. Now, this is not the prophet Micah, who later we will do study the book of Micah. This is just a man named Micah who was a Levite. He was a priest. And this is just so you know, like the Levites were the elite set apart, you know, the ones who were to represent God on this earth, weren't they? Well, he uh, starts out, we see him stealing from his mother. He steals a whole bunch of silver from his mother. When she complains, he returns some of it. But then what he does is he takes some of that silver and he makes an idol, an idol. And he builds a little shrine to it, like a temple to this idol. So, you know, we're looking at, um, oh, also, this is, this is, Ugh, this is horrible. Some scholars believe that this man, Micah, speaks of him as being the son of Gershom or something like it, to that effect. Some believe that he was a relative, a grandson of Moses. Oh my goodness, what would Moses, Moses would be so upset to know that he had a relative down the line who was a Levite, obviously, because Moses was of the line of the Levites, the priests, making shrines to other gods, melting down. I mean, Aaron got in super big trouble for that. And remember in Exodus, when, when Moses was walking down the mountain with the, with the Ten Commandments and... Um, Aaron's down there making an idol and God was very upset and the people were punished for that. Okay, so that's just terrible and it just shows you the moral decline of people who should know better. Um, then there's another story that is so horrible that I really am not going to mention it. I'm not going to talk about the particulars. It's this horrible, I'll just mention it so you know to go and read it. It's the story of a Levite who takes a concubine and well, I'll mention it in a roundabout way. And he, he travels with this concubine. So uh, he takes her to this place, the city, and he's in this house and the people of the town, the men of the town come knocking on the door, looking to have uh, relations with the men in the house and they're demanding it, but they throw this concubine out to, out to them, kind of to appease the evil of the crowd and what they're asking for. Anyway, the poor woman, dies from the abuse she receives and I mean the rest of the story is just so horrific and 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 puts a knot in your stomach at how horrible it how horrible it is and how it's even in there and the thing is it's all meant to talk talk to us about the 
the limitless decline. You will just decline to, to depths which you will not, society and, and people as individuals will decline to such moral de immoral depths when they push God out of the system, when they push God out of their lives, when they take God out of government, when they take God out of schools, when you take God out of, of everything and you expect there to be any good left, you know, we wonder sometimes why the world is what it is. And the world, many governments, our own governments, push God out in such, and tell God, we don't want you. We don't even believe in you. Out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. And then when the bad happens and we see such moral decline and things that are chaotic and crazy and hateful and, and we wonder why. When you push God out, God is love. You're pushing love out. He is good. He is kind. He is faithful. He is all of these things. And you're pushing all of that out when you push God out. Okay. Okay. So they have nobody to help them because they have no king. So this points to the future of Israel, right? Where they will later be led by kings. And ultimately for us as Christians, we now have a king who is the king of all kings. Jesus. And like the Israelites who needed good leadership to save them, we also need God's leadership. And when we exclude him and his kingship, we too, as Christians, can fall into depths of sinfulness. So we see God using people who are very sinful, right? I pointed that out. And, and they're not submitted to him, but there is no one else. But this isn't God's plan A, all right? Some people read this and they, they think that because God uses these individuals that he somehow sees past their immorality and their unfaithfulness. But if that were the case, then they would have remained at peace instead of these constant sin cycles. And that was not the case, was it? God uses imperfect people, okay? None of us are perfect, right? But there's a letter in the New Testament Paul writes to Timothy. Okay, and it discusses this very thing that the types of vessels, the types of people that God wants to use, he refers to them as vessels, and, and he talks about what kind God desires to use. Now, um, okay, uh, Paul encourages Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he's talking to Timothy in a letter about being a good soldier who isn't entangled with the affairs of this life, okay? Now, now Paul is saying, he's, he's telling Timothy, be a good soldier, don't get entangled in the affairs of this life. Don't let the affairs of this, this life, the immorality or any of it, get into the boat of who you are, okay? Because Timothy, it's gonna sink you, all right? And he's, but if you're telling someone to be a good soldier, that you're implying that it's possible to be a bad soldier who is so taken up with the natural world, with what, what's going on around, around them. And, and when I say the natural world and what's going, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's bad to take on natural causes and help people. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is this, that we have to remember first and foremost as spiritual people, okay, that we need to remember that we, and if you saw last week, you'll know this, that we need to fight battles and we need to look at things as spiritual people. And we need to remember that our enemies and the fights that we have in life are spiritual. And we talked about that in the book of Joshua. So go back to the teaching on Joshua and you'll, you'll see the talk that I gave on that, you know, our, our weapons are spiritual. Are, are, you know, and we're to fight with the spiritual weapons that God gave us. And we are to spite. And even though we see in the natural what's going on as spiritual people, we fight these battles in the spirit first, where we get the wisdom from God. And God brings down into this realm, into the natural realm, he brings his spirit wisdom. He brings heaven to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let it be done in the natural as it is in the spiritual. And we have to remember that as good soldiers of the Lord, okay? If we take on and get entangled with the affairs of this life, 
without going to the spiritual, then we are going to find that we're not fighting this effectively and we may find ourselves getting into places we don't want to be. Okay. Because um, our battle's more than flesh and blood, it says. So we want to be effective soldiers. So when we forget that even the world, um, in a world that needs so much change, our world needs so much change, that our ultimate mandate from God, right? What is our ultimate mandate from God in the scriptures? Is it to go feed the hungry? Is it, you know, uh, help orphans? Yes, we are to do those things. But you know what our number one mandate of Jesus is? And it's the root of all the other evil in the world. It's the root. So you get the root. And this is what it is. It is to go and preach the good news of the kingdom of God. That is the root. If we can get people to know God, to get saved, to understand the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, if we can get them to know that the Prince of Peace has come and they can have the Prince of Peace, that he will help people forgive, he will help people love, he will help people do the things that are impossible. And if we can do what God told us to do, which was to go out into all the world and preach the gospel, tell them about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Don't get entangled with the affairs of this life because if you hit, if you hit the rotten tree at the, the root, you'll get rid of the rotten tree. You get that? And Jesus gave us that when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Get them saved. Because when you get saved, you become a new creation in Christ. And old things are passed away. And all things are become new. You're broken and hurting on the inside like all the people in this world are broken and hurting and feeling the effects of sin and hate. They need Jesus. And that's what they need. And that's what we're to get out there and do is tell people about Jesus. All right? In your workplace, tell people about Jesus. In you know, everywhere you go, be telling people about the good news of the kingdom, that the king has come. Okay? All right. You know, another example of that is if you had a pipe and it was spewing poison out into our ocean and it was just constant, 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 what would you do, right? Would it be effective for you to go out with, with a pot and try to get all the poison and scoop it from the ocean into the pot, trying to clean up the ocean? No you would shut down that pipe, wouldn't you? You'd shut down the pipe. And that's what you do when you're preaching the kingdom of God to people. When you're telling people about Jesus, about King Jesus, you are shutting down the pipe and stopping the poison going out. And then the healing happens. So that's what we need to do. That is our mandate. We need to be out there preaching Jesus. If you are a Christian, your number one mandate is tell them about Jesus, okay? I don't, I don't know if I said that enough, right? I think it's a point I'm really trying to make. <laughs> All right, so 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 21, is Paul, um, again, writing this letter to Timothy. And this bit in my Bible is actually entitled, Approved and Disapproved Workers. Mm. So there are workers, that means they are godly people or people of God, who are workers in the household of God, which is all Christians. I'm not talking about just pastors or just, um, you know, uh, the people who do Sunday school. Or I'm not talking, I'm talking about everyone. Everyone is a worker in the house of God, aren't we? Okay, but this, this section is called approved and disapproved workers. All right, so 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. You know, when I read about Samson in its fullness and all the things he did, it's embarrassing. It's a little embarrassing. Even though he did so much good, and yes, I know he's immortalized in that famous chapter in, in Hebrews of faith, and I know that he's mentioned as a man of faith, but if you go back and read his account, it is embarrassing, and we do clean it up to tell our children. 
you know, that he was with, we don't tell them he was with prostitutes and all the things that he was doing. Even though he did so much good, it's immortalized in the scriptures that he was morally weak, he was a womanizer, and he was a violent man. And he was not repentant of it. He didn't even know to be repentant of it. And whereas you read about Joshua, and he's an honored, faithful statesman that even God has wonderful things to say about him. Okay? So again, reading the story of these workers, I don't want to be a worker that needs to be ashamed. I want to be the worker who can stand before God. You know, and I know we all do wrong. But you know what? We need to come to God with a repentant heart, say, I'm sorry, God, help me. And then we need to begin to go and do what God is asking us to do. Okay, verse 19, so 2 Timothy 2, 19. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Verse 20, but in a great house, this is meaning in the household of God, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold, like a chalice for royalty, and silver, but also of wood and clay. So we're talking about the household of God. We're all in the household of God if we know God, if we're Christians. And that in that household of God, there's golden vessels, there are silver vessels, there are wood, and there are clay. We see the decline in, in what, you know, in the fabric of what the vessel is made of. So you might have a golden vessel and, and that will be used for royalty and for the best of what God has. And he knows he can use that, that golden vessel, you know, and hold his head high. But he also has wood and clay vessels. And it says that those vessels are vessels that may be used, you know, that there are vessels like the golden ones could be used for honor and that the others for dishonor. Okay, we're talking like, let's say in a household, we have things that we hold as very special things, you know, the beautiful things that we have, the beautiful serving jug we put out on our table when we have guests. But we also have a garbage bin. Useful, isn't it? But it's not a vessel of honor. It's a garbage bin, okay? Anyway, verse 21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, meaning sin, he talks about sin, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And what I want you to notice from verse 21 is it says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself. Oh, but doesn't Jesus do all the cleansing? Isn't he the one? Yes, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, the word says. But then he's done the job and made us all beautiful and clean into this golden chalice that is a vessel of honor. That's what we are, all of us, when God had did the work. But if we decide to choose sin and to remain in sin and to live a life disobedient to God, then we're marring it up, we're mucking it up. We're the ones mucking up what God has done, the beauty that God has done. It says to cleanse oneself, and it tells you how to cleanse yourself. It wouldn't just say it and then not tell you how to do it. Verse 22 tells you how to stay clean. So flee youthful lusts. That's anything contrary to the will of God. And he's not just talking to young people. Timothy is a young pastor. So this letter is to a young pastor. But he's talking to all of us. Flee youthful lusts but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We have to do the fleeing. When you know something is a sin and God doesn't want you to do it and you get that little check in your heart and you think, oh, okay, I need to get away from, I need not to do this anymore. Flee, get away, don't do it anymore. If there's a bad attitude in your heart and you've been treating, let's say, your own family, you've been doing some, saying some bad stuff and not having a right attitude in your own home and God has touched your heart and said, you need to change that. Flee from it. Go the opposite direction. Have kind words coming out of your mouth. Go to God. Say, help me, God. I want to do your will and you will get all the help of heaven. You have the Holy Spirit inside you. Okay? But it says to flee those things and pursue righteousness. So pursue what God is asking you to pursue. P pursue the promises of God. You have trouble in your life, find promises of God that speak of God strengthening you, helping you, helping you to stay away from sin, helping you to, um, to obey God. To, all the things, look at all the scriptures about the power that is inside of you. 
the power of God inside of you that's even was so strong it was able to raise Jesus from the dead. Surely that power that is inside of us can help us in our day of need, okay? So we need to flee sin, pursue righteousness, and in that way, we become these vessels of honor that God can use, okay? So bear in mind that this was, an, uh, this was a letter that Paul was writing, okay? And there wouldn't have been chapters and verses. We put the chapters and verses in to help us with our reading of the scriptures. It would have gone straight into chapter three, what is our chapter three. And this is what it will look like in the last days in the world, in a world that runs toward lusts and flees away from God um, and his holiness. And, and this is it, and it's the description is just like Israel when they were in Canaan, living defeated. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, treach sorry, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people, much less be those people, right? Much less be those people. Let's consider what I just read. That is our society today. That was Israel when they rejected God and decided they wanted to live comfortably next to sin, the Canaanites that represent sin. Okay, let's consider this, that, that the covenant that God made with the children of Israel, that he would be their God. Remember that? He said, I'm making a covenant with you. Do you want in? He said that. He said, I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Just obey me and you'll be my special treasure in the whole earth. And even among, remember this, that even among the 12 tribes, we talked about this, the Levites were the priestly tribe and they were set apart and even from the other tribes. So we have the whole of Israel set apart from the whole world and the Israelites set apart even in the 12 tribes, right? The Levites. Now, we talked about that we are the Levites of the New Testament. We are the priests of a new covenant, all right? And those priests were twice set apart, okay? The Levites were twice, uh, uh, it, were, were twice set apart. We are so set apart in God. We are his special treasure. These people in Israel, the Israelites, they forgot who they were. They forgot that they were God's special treasure, separated from all the rest of the world, that he was going to be their God and they were going to be their people and all the beautiful blessings that were going to come upon them. They forgot, forgot. And I'm looking at 1 Peter 2.9. Peter writes about, about disobedient people saying, okay, uh, okay. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. Okay? Now this is speaking to New Testament people. They, they stumble being disobedient to the word which they were appointed. Verse 9. But you, this is us, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is us. His own special people that you mo may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Just like they were called to be God's special people, so are we, the New Testament people who accept what God says, who accept Jesus. We, it says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's us, okay? And so we must never, ever forget who we are. Israel forgot who they were and through the generations just became more and more corrupt. But we must never forget who we are. Let's learn from the book of Judges. How does a person, okay, if we are a royal priesthood, how does a person become legitimately royal, okay? A legitimately royal person, a real royal, okay, has to do with their bloodline, okay? He calls us a royal priesthood. 
Do you know why? Because we have this, we are born of God. That's what it says. When we became children of God and we gave our lives to him, it says we are now born of God, which means we have the blood of our, of our father running through us. We are legitimately a royal priesthood. We, when God looks at us, he sees royalty. His children, we are his. We have his blood running through us. Okay? Um, so you can add royal to the fact that you are the priests of the new covenant because of your father. You're royal because you now have his bloodline in you. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. If you've believed in the name of Jesus, if you've believed on that name, then you have become the children of God. Knowing this, who you are, your true identity, now let's live up to being the royals that we are. We are royalty. For example, would you ever see our queen, the queen of the United Kingdom, would you ever see her outside rolling around in the mud? You will never see that, ever. You wanna know why? Because she knows who she is. She's royal. Royalty does not roll around in muck, in dirt. Just like us, we are royal and we don't need to roll around in the muck and the dirt of sin because we know who we are. We know who our king is. We know who our father is. The people in the book of Judges had no king. They forgot their bloodline. They forgot who they were. They forgot they were the treasure of the most high God. But we have opportunity that we will never forget that. Never, never, never. Okay. All right. The, the word of God. And, and because of that, because we're God's set apart treasure, um, we can find ourselves as Christians, you know, even as Christians, we could find ourselves facing sin. We could find ourselves, it's there, it's around us. But we do what was written to Timothy and we flee sin and we pursue righteousness and we avoid these sin cycles like in the book of Judges. You know, we don't need to have sin cycles where we sin and then we, our life goes bad and bad things happen and then we repent and we're all in the dirt and the muck and the mire and then God's so good and he helps us and he brings us out of it and brings us to victory. But then we sin again. That is not our life and we don't need to have that life anymore, okay? The word of God says that we are no longer the sons of disobedience, okay? But that we are sons of righteousness now. So we don't have to fall into sin cycles, okay? The, the book in, of Judges, they had no king and did what was right in their own eyes. We have a king. And those are the final words in the book of Judges. We not only have a king, but we're royal because of that king, King Jesus. And if we call him king, if we say, Jesus, you are our king, then we're saying, in effect, that I am subject to you. And I'll do what you say. All right. Also, let's recall what it says in Proverbs 14, 12, that there is a way that seems right to a man, right? Like those people in the book of Judges, that they did what was right in their own eyes. It seemed right. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We do not want that, okay? We do not want the way of death. Let us do things God's way. Let's learn from the children of Israel and commit to never excluding God from, from any part of our lives so that we can be those golden vessels of honor that he desires to use. So that when he looks down at the earth, it's not like the day of the book of Judges where he, has, he doesn't have anyone to choose from, you know? He has to choose the best of a bad bunch, but not us. Let us not forget who we are who our king is, and that we are royalty as well. And on that note, I'm going to end, okay? And I hope you enjoyed that today, and I hope it cleared up a little bit of what the book of Judges is all about. And um, as you read it, just remember those key verses, you know, that they had no king, and they did what was right in their own eyes, and that that wasn't a good thing. That was a bad thing. And that we are a most blessed people who have the king of all kings. And have a wonderful week this week and enjoy, okay? God bless. Bye.